Uh, we're going to go on a bit of a journey, a bit, bit of a story about Snowy Hydro, uh, some of the overviews. I'm going to go into some of the bits of technology that I like, which are out there at the frontier, and give you some ideas of, uh, of where I think we can add a lot of value. Then we're going to come to some basic stuff, and I think it will resonate, uh, keep it simple, and do the simple stuff well. So let's go on a bit of a journey. And of course, uh, for the ones that have been watching the news recently, I will talk about Snowy 2, the pumped hydro storage system. So Snowy, as a nation building project, uh, it was initially conceived in the late 40s uh, under the Chifley regime. And uh, then it transitioned through, through the Menzies years. And it was, uh, uh, was actually nation building. It was to divert the water that was, uh, the snow that was raining down, if you forgive the, the mixture there in the, uh, in the mountains, that was flowing through into the Tasman Sea to send it into the food bowls of Australia. And then to use uh, hydropower as a way to, to subsidize and generate value from the system. So we still capture that water. We still move it around. Uh, we keep the Murray-Darling Basin um, uh, fed with water, uh, but we also uh, do generate a lot of power. And that power is becoming increasingly important in today's transition to renewables as it's peaking power that is really at the core of our organization. You've got the picture of the, picture of the scheme on, the, uh, uh, on, your, on, your, uh, tr on your boards there. Uh, it's a large scheme of interconnected dams and interconnected uh, waterways. That's roughly about 160 kilometers of intermountain tunnels and about 80 kilometers of aqueducts that move the rivers around uh, through a set of dams. There are 33 individual generating for, uh, generators on that scheme uh, that are interconnected and have to be harmonized. And I will give the engineers a bit of an engineering injection of techo stuff in a few minutes, but just hang on for me. Um, uh, it's a real cool system. And if you, uh, if you want a holiday, it's snowing now up on the hills. Come and visit our visitor centers. Your kids are invited. As a lot of companies did, uh, Snowy vertically integrated. So you have this, this asset sitting at the back end, which is the scheme itself. And we've moved beyond the scheme to add more power to our facilities. And we've vertically integrated. And we now supply about a million homes with uh, electricity. But we also buy gas and we retail gas through. So we're a vertically integrated renewable company, renewable energy company. Everybody's got a set of value statements. Uh, we value our storage. Uh, we value our capacity, the ability to turn things on and off, uh, the customer service. Typically, Snowy is, is, is at the top of the customer, the, Mo the Morgan polls, the customer satisfaction polls. That is something that Red Energy, which is the brand that we, we use to take to the customer, value highly. And uh, it's a vertically integrated business. So I'll slow down a bit now. Snowy 2.0. Uh, Snowy 2.0, which is the pumped hydro scheme, and I'm going to show you a little bit more in the next slide. It was actually written, uh, it was first can be picked up in a commissioner's letter in the early 60s. So William Hudson uh, wrote about how it could be, this could be done, this concept could be done. But in those days, uh, the value of capacity was low. Uh, the cost of building that system wouldn't have offset the, uh, uh, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have been uh, offset by the price of power on the market. It was revisited in 1980. And there's a point here about corporate history. And I'm going to kind of link that with the technology in a few minutes, but there's the corporate history point in that we never forgot. And there's a good reason why it never forgets, and God bless it, because I've worked for big commercial organizations that just love to uh, throw the paperwork, uh, paperwork away as soon as the seven years come up. Snowy's never thrown a piece of paper away. So my, but the value of that asset, this is actually an amazing hidden asset on the balance sheet that we can't see. And also, every data, just to give you an idea, in an, every hour, um, every, sorry, every minute, sorry, every, every, I'll, do it, I'll do it per hour. Every hour, we generate about 200 million records off the system, uh, sensor, sensor feeds, and uh, we've never thrown anything away. <laughs> A lot of data storage. So that history's there. And that history was there before the world ever thought about big data and the cognitive computing and the wonderful things that we can do with Watson and use Watson as an example. There are other platforms out there. 
So there's a message here. This was a, this was an, a government body organisation. It's run as a corporate. It has an independent organ, an independent management team, an independent board. It clears dividends back to its shareholders. Uh, but the value of that data is quite quite staggering. So 1980, it was re-looked at, Snowy Two, and in 1990, it was re-looked at, and then it was re-looked at this year. As soon as we started to see the change in the market. Uh, about the time, a little bit before the time of the, the blackouts in, uh, in uh, South Australia. So it's a, it's a pumped hydro scheme. I'm going to show you where it fits in a minute. It will fit in with all the other range of storage capacities that we need, which is batteries. We need lots of batteries. And you can, for the engineers around here, you know, you go and do the test. Uh, a Tesla Powerwall 2 stores 13.5 kilowatt hours. And then you figure this thing out, and then just do the back calculation, figure out the capital cost. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you'll come up with a big number, and I hope you've got lots of noughts on your calculator. Um, it's, it's peaking power. We come in and we come out. We come in and we come out. And that is the beauty about hydroelectric, uh, hydroelectric schemes. So it's, uh, it's well underway. We're looking at a... I spent a lot of time on the uh, feasibility study at the moment. We have drills up in the... Up on, the, up on the mountains looking at uh, uh, reconfirming our geological, uh, geotechnical information. Uh, the original scheme designs have been extended and the station is in, and the system is well into design. So this is where the engineers can go, oh, I've got some technology in front of me. Um, look at Guthaga, top left. The numbers at the top left are the, uh, that's the height above sea level. So look, the big numbers are the height above sea level. So the value of this is that fuel comes in uh, in either snow or rain. Uh, it ultimately is water flowing into the dams. And we're dropping it from 1575 down to 351 RL, you know, 1.2 kilometers. And that's the potential energy that you're releasing. Um, so Snowy 2.0 runs from Tantangra, which I think, I think I've got a laser beam here that will work. Uh, Tantangra, which is at 1216. To Talbingo at 541. About 29 kilometers of 12 meter tunnels, um, vertical drop of about 800 meters into a large cavern, and all the engineering around it. But the, the nice thing about it is it's instantaneous power, instantaneous. That system here, this system here, which, whoops, a daisy, this system here, this system up here, there, diesel stations gas power stations, gas power stations that are on the network, but this system here is 4.1 gigawatts, and that can come online about four to five minutes. That's just, can come online. We've got some great engineers that have figured how to do that. So Snow 2.0 will add another two gigawatts to, uh, of, uh, of capacity, uh, which is um, uh, uh, 350,000 megawatt hours over the, over the period. So that's Snowy 2.0. I'm using interconnected, integrating, integrated, and increasingly intelligent. And increasingly intelligent is the bit, that's the word that I ask you to hang on to when we come to what I call frontier technologies. By the way, all, that's all controlled from one control room, as you'd expect, and has been done for years. So this is the world that we live in. Uh, turbines, water, snow. Uh, we've got the gas stations got the diesel stations, we're bringing a solar farm in, up in, uh, in South Australia. So part of the national heritage uh, built by the nation for the nation. So let's talk about, um, about us. What's the digital structures inside Snowy Hydro? And I'm going to tell you, I, I, I have been with Snowy nearly two years now. It will be coming two years soon. And this was a journey started by my predecessors and their predecessors did some great thinking. I've been fortunate to accelerate that along and maybe add to, add to the debate um, as we go forward. So firstly, I'll give you a model. Everybody needs a model. Uh, the first model is frontier systems. So how we control our, our complete network. That's a frontier system because that's ours. Uh, how we put intelligence into our SCADA systems and load up the latest algorithm, that's ours. How we leverage all of that data that's not been thrown away, that's ours. How we use predictive analytics to predict when things are going to fail, that's ours. That's frontier. That's tied to our organization. Foundations, everybody has got them. 
You have them in all your organization. You need to build your frontiers on the top of very solid foundations. People get mixed up. They get the ERP gets mixed up as a frontier system. It's not, it's just a way to run your business. It's got to be simple, it has to be installed, it has to be fit for purpose, and it has to be uniform. So we think of foundation and frontier, and how that builds up, and I believe these slides, for anybody taking note, are gonna be available at the end, so please, please don't, uh, don't bother uh, taking the notes. Uh, ABB sit at the center of, of, of our, and I'm gonna talk about that today, of our foundation systems in their ELIP platform. And I'm going to talk about why we need them. Because if you do not have solid foundations, and by the way, I was the guy that brought autonomous trucks into Australia. Um, I did that program. And that was built because the corporation had wonderful foundation systems. So if you try and bring advanced technology, leading edge technology into an organization that doesn't have solid foundations, good luck, because you will fail. It will be a very miserable experience. So. Let's unpack foundations and frontiers and then start to walk into some of the clever things that I think can be done on the top of solid foundations. Again, another model. I love models. Uh, you can tell I've been hanging around McKinsey's for far too long. Um, uh, I would put this as a hypothesis to everybody in the room. You've all got one of these and it looks something like this. Uh, every organization uh, I've touched over the last two to three years and said, well, is this kind of you? They all say, yeah, this is kind of me. In today's modern world, you've got to bound your organization with cyber protection. We had that conversation this morning. Do it. Uh, WannaCry came out, we just went to sleep. Uh, we were well secure. And I, I'm not gonna say it. the next one may get us, but we, we knew what it was, we knew the whole system was there and it was there and it was working. Um, today in our business, you've got to have solid networks. You've got to have advanced networks, you've got to have a WAN and a LAN, and they have to be intelligent and they've got to be integrated in with your cyber protection world, and that's a specialist art in itself. But do that and do it well, and you're getting the plumbing right. You're getting the base of your organization right. And then you've got to take care of your people. Uh, you have to have this thing called the, the desktop or the working environment. We've gone for a very different kind of working environment. Um, it's, it's just the way that the organization's gone. I'm not saying one's against the other, but I'm going to explain that to you. And then you've got the, the old ERP world. It's the dull blue stuff in the middle, but it's the stuff that people get wrong so many times. I'm using SAP, forgive me, ABB. I'm using SAP uh, acronyms here. It's manage physical assets, purchase to pay, hire to retire, contract to cash. They are the workflows and the glue that most businesses, than all businesses, basically have underneath. And how often you see that those workflows are broken, that the senior management don't understand them, that you have people managing the glue in the middle, and that gives you rocky foundations, and yet somebody wants to go off and do some brain science stuff with some app. It's, it's a problem. It's a big problem. Then over the top, business intelligence. And that's all geared to your... Uh, that's all geared to your, your, core, your core value proposition, which is how you make money. With us, we make money from water through to the customer and behind the meter. But equally, that model, um, you could go in and have a conversation with Walmart. That model, you can go and have a conversation with, I don't know, even Microsoft in the way that they run their business. So that's solid foundations. Absent them, and I'm going to close off with it, absent solid foundations, uh, and I've done a lot of the high-tech stuff, um, and the business in Rio had invested an awful lot of money in foundations. Absent this stuff working well, uh, your advanced technology dreams are going to be very difficult to fulfill. So this is Ellipse, and Kenneth's there. He's just started to twitch out of Kenneth. I've talked about Ellipse. Um, uh, it's a good product. We're working with it. We've got a good partner. We are a maintenance-heavy business, and this product needs to stand up and support our business. And I'll talk about what we're going to need out of the organization uh, as we go forward. Now, these people, uh, does anybody recognize Generation C? Has anybody heard of it before? Booz Allen Hamilton, 2011, which seems a, a million years ago, they wrote a seminal, prod, uh, seminal paper called Generation C. It was Generation Connected. And it hypothesized that any bo anybody born after 1990 was Generation C. I think it was 1990. It was 1990. Generation C was they did not know a world. You know, my, my kids would laugh if they saw a fax machine. You know, 
giggle, giggle, giggle. Um, uh, and I had a Generation C moment oh, about five years ago when I went in and to have a bark at my daughter and said, well, get off Facebook. You have homework to do. And she turned around and looked at me like a mongoose looks at a snake and said, it's, it's the Khan Academy dad and it's calculus. I thought, they've got me, they've got me. So the, these people are going to run our industries. Generation C is coming through. So Generation C is the top talent that's coming through. Do they, what are they going to do if they hit Generation, I don't know, what, what are we going to call it? Generation Victorian. Yeah. Quill pen. Uh, paper. So your working environment, if you want to attract the best, has got to be Generation C. Uh, it's a good paper, by the way. Booz Allen Hamilton, Generation C. And there is an argument now that Generation C is anybody who's transitioned to connected. So it's, that, it's taken away the ageist, ageist thing. So part of our push for Generation C is total mobility. Absolute total mobility. So from any device, we have no desk phones in the organization. Uh, they've all been switched off. Everybody has a top-end um, um, Android uh, Samsung device. Uh, people have tablets. And any data, any system can be accessed from any device. That's the design uh, from the mobile phone. You can access all the data that you ever wanted to have uh, within the security protocols that we've set up. Also, totally cloud. Um, I think we've basically got the servers are all going now. All, the last of the apps are being managed out of the business now. I think we've got one more to go. Everything's gone to the cloud. Uh, so we've got our corporate records in the cloud. We have our data systems in the cloud. And the, um, the records are in the cloud. Historians in the cloud. And with, the, with, the, with our mobile devices, then we've engaged with um, advanced, using the Google suite, uh, uh, advanced end-to-end -end video conference. So you can video conference anybody to anybody. Um, I think it's up to 30 people. Once you unleash mobility and collaboration and everybody can work on one document, you just get this different environment. You start tapping into Generation C. So cloud, mobility, and Chromebooks. Um, uh, it's a device, not a religion. So I don't care about PCs or Chromebooks. or I've got an app. It doesn't matter. Their device is not religions. Uh, the Chromebook is cheap. It's got nothing on it. So if somebody loses a device, you give them another device, you give them a login, they're away, and all the data is controlled in our corporate systems. So that's the direction we've got. If they need to access the Windows suite, they, that's fine. They can do that through a, a virtual desktop. So that's, that's kind of how we've gone. So we're getting into it, and that's, that's been implemented, or it's well implemented. So and another thing, once you've set the, if you look at the, up here, once you've set the environment, you've got uh, tablets, you've got, you've got these devices, you've got the phones, you've got the, um, the Chromebooks. Then that demands on what's underneath, and I'm concentrating at the moment with the four key workflows, that's got to be web enabled and mobile. Gone are the days you want, to, you want somebody to sit on something that looks like a terminal out of the 1980s. Unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, this, if, if the vendors won't do it, skin it. Uh, Tableau will do it. Bidirectional control will do it. HTML5 will do it. But just make a dedication to mobile and accept no prisoners as you go through. Every report has to be available wherever you want it, everywhere on that device. And it is possible and it's, you know, it's just doable. And it's not expensive these days. So again, putting the bits of the bits of the uh, puzzle together. So what's, what's exponential? Why, is it, why have I been talking about exponential? And what does that thing come in? Well, I'm a bit of a fan of a bloke called Kurzweil. And he's, he's, he's Ray Kurzweil, he's a really good thinker. And uh, if you read, read his work and you read some of the latest, uh, uh, latest work on artificial intelligence, the world is going exponential around us. Uh, we touched upon that this morning with Microsoft. We've got Moore's Law on the chips. Everybody's heard about Moore's Law. Data storage. The costs are becoming, it's just staggering. Um, I think when you, to store a terabyte of data in the late 80s was 80, to store and manage was $83,000 a month. And now it's 40 cents a month. It's just, see which way it's going. 
Um, this internet, that, the Internet of Things people talk about is what I've been involved in all of my life. The robotics work that we did in Rio, we had to wire the whole thing together. We started to wire our uh, facilities around the world together. That's there. It's unstoppable. And the sensors are becoming very, very small. So it's how you choose to bring that together. And these are not at the speed of thought. We work at the speed of our thought. We are wired to be linear. We remember ourselves when we were children. We remember the joining of the dots. This is all happening exponentially. These are exponential trends. It's picking those exponential trends and figuring out how they can add value to you and to your company and the society that you live in, that's going to be the trick going forward. I'm going to give you three of them that I think we, that, that we kind of buy into. And um, I'll give you some models at the end. So there's one, and I'm going to look for nods around the room. Uh, and you saw the way, did you see the way that the, um, the demographics were changing? Was that the Microsoft presentation this morning? One of the presentations? Um, organizations, um, and I'm, I'm no spring chicken, organizations have got a bow wave. And there's this bow wave of people that are retiring. If you look at Snowy Hydro, we used to run the business, I'm going to make the numbers up, let's say 8,000 person years of experience. And if you watch the retiring coming through, even just holding the, the numbers right, let's say that number can drop to 3,000 person years of experience on something that's actually very knowledge based. This is a knowledge based bespoke system. How do, you plug, how do you plug that gap? How do you plug that gap? Well, there are ways of doing it. I encourage anybody, and I'm going to I'll drop a few hints here because I think they've just done some cool stuff. Has anybody seen the Watson at Woodside video? Go and have a look at that. Just go and have a look at it. So you've got an organization uh, which is running the, it's, it's the ranking platforms um, that probably doesn't have as much information as Snowy in its corporate memory because we have this wonderful database. And they've basically loaded up to the Watson corpus every report. Everything has gone up there. And also, all the data signals are going in there. Um, the life of those rigs are going in there. And Willow, which is the front end of the thing, it, and Watson is Bluemix, so they're just, it's, it's a platform. They picked a few of the bits of the platform. And you can have a conversation with Willow and say, um, you know, how do we, it's, what have we ever thought about landing those helicopters in, in this environment? Or what, was the, what happened the last time we saw this? on, these, tra on these, uh, these pumps. That's cognitive memory. It's cognitive, cognitive, cognitive. And that's going to become very profound. I gave a presentation in May. Um, part of my day job, non-day job, is I'm president of iChemE. And I was saying for engineers of the future, uh, rote learning in, in books uh, is going to be replaced by cognitive assistance. So you'll be, I, I learned to do heat transfer, mass transfer, and all that wonderful stuff and kind of enjoyed it. I need to understand the basics, but I will have a cognitive assistant that knows that better than anybody else and is learning. Just to be a modern doctor, if you wanted to read what the medical profession publishes every month and says you should read, you'd be doing 160 hours a month of reading. Not possible. The machines will do that. Digital twin, if you're well censored, if you have all the data in your ARPs as well, the history, um, you can create digital twins. You, in the fifth dimension, the assets can be sitting there in a digital world, and in the digital world, you can start to do, uh, you can start to play with them, you can start to optimize them, and you can start to do design on them in a way that you'll never do in the physical world. Um, you see, G predicts. You know, not punting them. They've done some good thinking on this. Siemens have done some good thinking on this. I'm sure that ABB have. So this concept of where all the data comes together and you create digital twins of physical assets. And predictive analytics, this was the thing that uh, really uh, cooked my burger at my previous job. I've got to tell you, it's damn cool. It is so cool when the machine learning people, the mathematicians, and some guy who's worked around engines for 30 years comes up and say, we found it. And what it was was that magic algorithm that if you apply it to the data signals of the, Q, uh, the Cummings QSK-60 engines, you could predict head failure five months in advance. You know, I may sound like a weird engineer, but it's really cool. So it's all doable. These are the things that are going to be pulled out by exponential forces, not our traditional foundation systems. No. We just need to do those. We need to do those very well. The stuff at the frontier is going to be pulled apart by these exponential forces. 
and it's, it's, it's the game of figuring out how you can apply these to maximize the value out of your value chain that, that is the most important thing, I would predict. So I'm going to put this out. This will go out in the packs. Cognitive computing is that concept that you can take everything in the corpus. So as, as the person years of, as the person years of um, experience falls in your business, even though you're holding the number of people, as that person years of falls because we're retiring out people, uh, you can build up on the cognitive side um, just what Woodside have done and a few, uh, quite a few others now starting to do that cognitive knowledge. Look at what the medical industry has done. Uh, look at what the law industry has done. It's now moving into our space. Digital twinning. Yep, it's got a bit, it won't be long, and that will lead you to 3D visualization, but it will be all the data, right down to that is my digital twin, that is the turbine on the digital twin, and the ERP is telling me the last time I changed the turbine, the maintenance I did on it, uh, who I bought it from, and what the metallurgy is, and what the spec is. Just the complete, and also what is its current runtime environment, and it's, it's, it's there, and this is exponential. And predictive analytics, I, I'm, I'm, we're all pushed for time, but geez, I could spend a week on that. It is so cool. Um, I need a life. I know you're telling me that. So um, just some of that frontier value, you've got to figure that out yourself. Figure it out. And I'm gonna fi I'll finish off on foundations. Don't build frontiers unless you've got good foundations. Don't do that. All right? That's not going to be smart get that right. The frontier value, figure out how that fits in the value chain. One of the great things that we've done at the moment within Snow is we're putting in our new SCADA system. And within the heart of the SCADA system, um, there's somewhere between 20 and 30 person years of knowledge that's been built up in subsidiary systems and also in operator and operating rules that's been codified and brought down to very clean algorithms that's been embedded in there. So the, the machine's intelligent out of the box. And then we see that as we go forward, we're dealing with nonlinear situations. You know, you've, 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 we've bashed the polynomials to death. We now can start moving into genetic algorithms and be very clever in the way that we dispatch our, uh, our assets to get the maximum value out of every drop of water that flows down that hill. So that's kind of what's happening inside our world. So I know I'm, I've been banging on about this. That's my reflective message. Now get your foundations right, otherwise you're going to fall off the head of, edge of a cliff. And just my wish list for you, Kenneth. Um, that's my wish list for you. This, your, the slide's done for you. Um, we're with you on the ERP journey. Continue to advance it. It's not static. Everything goes in leapfrogs. Leapfrog your competitors. The co uh, it has to be a partnership. We've got to be working with you. You've got to be working with us. So for, and it's a wider community because everybody's using, the number of people that are using your platform are, um, are pretty wide. And we don't have all the answers. Thanks a lot. That's a, quickly the snowy story. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>